Welcome on into the Cougar Tracks podcast powered by kslsports.com. I am your BYU insider, Mitch Harper. Folks, what did we just witness? BYU takes down Utah 22-21 to at Rice-Eccles Stadium. The Cougs remain undefeated 9-0 in the 2024 season. Still atop the Big 12 standings as the lone undefeated team. And it took some last-minute heroics once again, going to share my thoughts on this game in this edition of the podcast. So much to unpack from BYU and Utah, 22 to 21. And there were many stretches in this game where I just thought BYU didn't have it tonight. BYU did not have it, but they always find a way. And Will Farron boots a 44 yard field goal to give BYU the victory with three seconds left, and an amazing win for BYU. Now, it was ugly. It was not a thing of beauty, this game. BYU finishes with 339 total yards. Utah only 259, but they grind it out. It almost felt like it had to be that way at Utah. You know, BYU, I still believe, is the better football team in in many respects, much better football team than Utah, but Utah gave their best crack at BYU coming out of the bye week their best look. BYU took the haymaker, they responded, they bounced back, and they get their second consecutive win in the rivalry against the Utes. First time that's happened since 2007. First time BYU's won in Salt Lake since 2006. This game started out... BYU gets a three and out. Defense is flying out of the gates. And you're thinking, okay, this is a great start for BYU... Then BYU, their offensive series, a lot of flags, a lot of penalties. They got to clean that up. They were forced to punt. BYU didn't allow much to Utah until the second quarter. Brandon Rose got going with his feet. And that's where the game started to turn for Utah. Utah, an offense that had been non-existent for the past month in the season, Scores 21 points in the second quarter. Pretty crazy stuff. BYU had opportunities to punch it in with touchdowns, and they just couldn't do it. They had to settle for a field goal in the first quarter. And that's when you knew when BYU had to settle for a field goal, you're like, okay, this is going to be one of those dogfight nights, and it's just going to come down to the horn. It's going to come down to the final wire like it always does with BYU and Utah. I I just... Whenever you're settling for field goals on the road, that just screams it's going to be a close game, and that's what it was. BYU, though, some of my big kind of big picture takeaways from this game, BYU did not play a pretty game. There were times where Jake Retzloff, I thought, kind of looked like Jake from last year. Some of the ill-advised throws, he put the ball on the turf. There were some poor snaps from... This offensive line from Bruce Mitchell, I thought he had a kind of a tough night, low snaps, a couple penalties for him. But but Jake Retzloff, he has this, this belief that they're always going to win. And BYU knows how to win. For the first time, I would say, in the Kalani Satake era, BYU gets faced with pressure, and you've got to deliver in a spot like this, and they always rise to the occasion. There was no other Kalani Satake team since he's been the head coach in 2016 where they had that attribute in their DNA where you're up against it, you got to deliver in the clutch. They've done that twice now. Now you could say, you know, Utah, Oklahoma State, not very good football teams. 1 in 12 combined in Big 12 play this season. But you got the best versions of those teams. And Utah could spiral out of control and be Honestly, they could finish 4-8 and eight this season. It's possible with the remaining schedule that they have on their slate. Oklahoma State probably loses out too, but you took the best shots from these teams with decorated coaches that have been around their programs for two-plus decades, and you took everything they got, and you still came out on top. And I just think that's a valuable attribute for this BYU team going forward. Jake finishes 15-33, 219 yards. completion rate, that's not the greatest. I was a little bit disappointed with the BYU offense, how they were not running L.J. Martin enough in the first half. Honestly, the entire game, 11 carries, 68 yards, 
I wanted LJ to get 20 totes. LJ deserves the rock a lot more than he got in this game. And I know Utah's defensive front was playing some pretty good football. They were healthy. Keanu Tanavasa was all over the place. Connor O'Toole, Logan Fano. They played some really good ball. But I just felt like there was not enough touches given to LJ. And I, well, I wanted to see a little bit more work from him. The receivers showed up in a big way for BYU. There was a drop from Darius Laster, which got to clean that up. No drops. It's always inexcusable. Six catches for 91 yards for Chase Roberts. Darius Laster, four catches, 46 yards. JoJo Phillips, I thought he had a breakout performance. Two catches, 41 yards. Maybe the best game of his BYU career. Parker Kingston and Keelan Marion as well. Keelan Marion. How about the BYU special teams? Always delivering. Keelan Marion comes up with a touchdown. After Utah gets on top 7-3, to Keelan Marion immediately answers 10-7 to BYU with a touchdown and a kick return touchdown. That's been BYU this season. When you feel like a team is gaining momentum on BYU or they've got the momentum in their favor, BYU always answers. Now, Utah answered quickly on their own right after BYU's kick return touchdown. Smith Snowden had a big return, and then Utah was on the move quickly uh, to get back out on top. But that was significant, getting that touchdown return from Keelan Marion. He becomes one of only four BYU football players to have two kickoff TD returns in a season. That's special stuff coming from Keelan Marion. But we got to talk about that final drive of the game. BYU takes over on their own nine-yard line with 156 remaining. Keep in mind, in the media, they allow us on the field at the end of the game. And I'm on the field level. I'm seeing the BYU players come out on the field. Utah's coming out on the field. Rice Eccles Stadium was deafening. It was so loud. And the Utah defenders were rallying the fans to get even louder. And it just... You thought, okay, maybe BYU's got a chance because they had that 95-yard drive earlier that gave you the proof of concept like, yes, you can move and, and get downfield, and you only need a field goal to win this game. But still, that was a hostile environment that Jake Retzloff and the BYU offense was stepping into. First three plays of the drive, BYU has to basically throw it away. The first pass was intended for Chase Roberts. Smith Snowden breaks it up. Second throw, throw it away because of the pressure. Third and 10, it's getting loud. Retzloff throws it away again. Fourth and 10, it looked like a safety from my vantage point on field level. But then, of course, fourth and 10, it looked like a safety initially, but then BYU called the timeout. Uh, So that should be noted. And then, so fourth and 10 actually gets played out. Jake's under pressure. He gets hit. But JoJo Phillips, Zamaya Vaughn, holds JoJo Phillips. Now, there's been a few camera angles of the play. The TV announcers even said that was a good call. It did look like it was the right call. I understand where Utah's ticked about the the call, and that's what set Mark Harlan off the rails to go to the podium and be visibly upset about the officiating crew for stealing it away from Utah, but there's been a couple angles now, even from fan shots in the stands. It looked like a hold. It looked like a hold. And you got to call that. If it's a hold, it's a hold. You got to call it. Now, I understand the argument of late in game. You just kind of let it slide, but some of those angles, you did see the jersey pulled, and it's old. It's a tough call. I mean, it's a tough spot to be in for those refs, but... um Very surprising to see Mark Harlan just go off (laughs) at the podium like that and complain about the league, question the outcome, and say it was stolen from them. I mean, that's some intense stuff. There's a little bit of a precedent. The Big 12 had this situation happen at Baylor during the basketball season. A.D. Mac Rhodes called out the officiating, and he got a hefty fine. I think it was about $50,000 complaining about officiating in a Big 12 basketball game, this is Big 12 football, with an undefeated team involved, and it was a rivalry game. 
kind of wonder what the fine could be potentially for Mark Harlan here. The Big 12 football director, Scott Draper, he was in attendance at the game. And you wonder what was going through his mind, seeing and hearing those complaints about the league. Harlan said he's going to be contacting Commissioner Brett Yormark. So we'll, we'll see what comes of that. But BYU's drive continued. First down, Calhoun gets pass breakup for Utah. So again, Utah's having success. BYU's really getting no success through the air to move downfield. They're still at their own 19-yard line with only 122 to go. Retzlaff connects with Chase Roberts near midfield. It's under review, but it was a catch. And, man, you're just thinking, they're going to pull something off. I mean, when they had that big of a chunk play converted, they're in business. It's on now. And Will Farron's got a huge leg. And it's on. And then next play, Lasseter, first down, out of bounds. Next play, Hinkley, Hinkley Rapati down to the 25, gain of 14, first down. Bruce Mitchell then gets one of his penalties, which, again, Bruce needs to clean those sort of things up. Young guy, though. He's been a heck of a player for BYU at that center spot. Just There were some areas where he can clean things up a little bit. Hinkley Rapati then gets a run. Utah calls a timeout. Retzloff run, no gain. Utah timeout, LJ Martin run. And then clock's running. BYU has no timeouts. Utah has no timeouts. Fourth down, Will Farron boots a 44-yarder to give BYU the 22-21 to 21 victory. Four seconds were left, and then Utah tried to do a kick return with a bunch of laterals, and it didn't work, and BYU comes away victorious with an epic victory. And it, it's just one that it wasn't pretty by any stretch, and it's a classic BYU-Utah rivalry where, you know, BYU, they just do not dominate Utah and Salt Lake. But I think that you'd rather have this experience rather than adding Brandon Rose to the names of Brett Ratliff, John Hayes, T.D. Croshaw, that sort of heartbreak because you were dancing with fire. (laughs) There were stretches, man, where you thought, this is just not going to work for BYU tonight, but they prevailed and get it done with a huge win. I thought defensively the second half, BYU was outstanding. Utah was held to only 59 yards in the second half. They could not do anything. Utah's drives in the second half. This is as follows. Punt, four plays, 13 yards. Play Drive number two, two plays, interception. Crew Wakely comes up with the pick. Nine plays, 36 yards, punt. Four plays, 16 yards, punt. Three plays, one yard, punt. Three plays, negative seven yards, punt. BYU's defense was locked in in the second half. Isaiah Glasker said an interesting tidbit in the postgame press conference. He said that they prepared for both quarterbacks, but they more so prepared for Isaac Wilson. Very interesting because a lot of the intel and the buzz was trending towards Brandon Rose as early as Monday earlier this week. So kind of interesting there. And that could have been, again, a lot of the bye week prep uh, that you know Isaiah Glasker is referring to, but Brandon Rose he had some success early on, but struggled mightily in the second half. And Utah couldn't get anything going against BYU's defense. Glasker had another big game; he had seven tackles, uh, two solo. Harrison Taggart eight tackles. I thought Jack Kelly was big time. Seven tackles, one tackle for loss. His speed is just elite. It always shows up. It always travels no matter where BYU goes. Jack Kelly's a big-time NFL linebacker in the future. John Nelson showed up in a big way. Five tackles. He had some quarterback hurries. Or not quarterback hurries, but he had some pressures. He had one where he could have got a sack, just needed to get home, but couldn't finish the job on Brandon Rose. Raider DeMooney, four tackles. Almost had an interception. Just kind of outstretched his hands of Brandon Rose's throw. And it was a big gain for Utah through the air in the in the second quarter. But sound performance from BYU defensively in the second half, and they made the necessary adjustments. And you, you wonder what's going through the mind of someone like defensive coordinator Jay Hill. You know, he rolled up it at the stadium, and it was kind of interesting too. the The team pulled up on a, on the team bus. Usually, they're always there about two hours before, and it was a little bit later arrival than usual. 
look, the whole night just kind of felt different. I don't know how to describe it. BYU Utah games are just they're not normal. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it other than that. They're not normal. Uh, BYU was under the two-hour mark before kickoff, and they're getting off the team bus, and you see Jay Hill in his sports coat, and he's walking off, and you're just kind of wondering what what's going through his mind. You know, he grew up a Utah man, and he played there. He coached at Utah, and now he's coaching at BYU, and he helped BYU get a victory over his alma mater, Kind of wonder what he's thinking after that win on Saturday night. But it was a big one for him in this defense. And, you know, Aaron Roderick, the offensive side, the play calling was kind of hit and miss in that first half. I thought they kind of settled in, though. And I thought that 95-yard drive was a big difference. And I pointed to it earlier. You know, nine plays, 95 yards. It just gave you the proof of concept that they can move the ball and they can finish off the job. So when you get put into a two-minute situation against Utah's defense that was playing some pretty good ball, you can move on them and get downfield and get some points. I I thought that 95-yard drive was really impressive from BYU. And, you know, once again, it's these two-minute drill spots. Now, not all the two-minute situations were pretty for BYU on Saturday night. It should be noted. Clock management... It can be easy to forget it now because you won. But that was brutal in the first half for BYU. The way that they were operating to close out the second quarter, the unnecessary time they were allowing off the clock, the way that they were using their timeouts and the whole gamesmanship with the whole substitutions, it was back and forth. It was just, it was an ugly football game in many respects. But the clock management has got to get cleaned up. It kind of reared its ugly face what you saw last year from BYU with how they handled their timeouts and things like that. And and then it backfired at the end of the second quarter. Bruce Mitchell gets called for a penalty. A 10-second runoff occurs, and there needed to be at least three seconds remaining to get a playoff and clock the ball. The penalty happened at the 11-second mark on the clock. That brings it down to one. Half is over, and BYU goes in the locker room, and they can't get any points from that. Imagine if Will Farron could have had the chance to boot a field goal there and get some points, and then BYU would have had the ball to start the third quarter. It just changes maybe the the, the dynamics of the game, and maybe you're not left with a game-winning field goal scenario. Maybe there's a little bit different feel to how you know that game really played out if you can get those points at the end of the second quarter. So it all worked out for BYU, sure. But this is, once again, another game where you got to get better. And we're, we're talking about BYU now in the college football playoff conversation. It's no longer this, I'll just get to a bowl game. They've already been there, done that. They, they've already clinched bowl eligibility a month ago. Now it's about being among the best teams in college football. And look, Everyone in college football can go down on any given night. That's what we've learned about this season. But you got to start playing a lot better for a full 60 minutes going forward. You want to start playing your best football in the month of November. This is where championships are won. And I thought it was a great showing against Utah to just come up big in those spots. But you want to get back to some complete performances. Uh, They have got to improve on that front, I think they will against Kansas offensively in particular. And I think defensively tightened up for sure against Utah. But uh, clock management is one where Kalani, and he took ownership of that in the postgame press conference. They have got to get that fixed moving forward for BYU. But I think it's safe to say this was another classic chapter in the BYU-Utah rivalry. So much was made about rivaling right coming into this series. The return of BYU and Utah in the Big 12 Conference. And then to see Mark Harlan have that moment. Not the greatest look. I didn't see any sort of sideshow antics after the game. I was down on the field and I, you know, BYU fans were very loud and proud and as they should be. I mean, their team just won. But I didn't hear any... You know, jawing back and forth with Ute fans. Seemed like they kind of just dispersed and went home. B 
BYU fans hung around for a while as long as they could to celebrate with their team and and enjoy that victory. So hopefully there's nothing that comes out of the fan interaction. It seemed like by all accounts it was just pretty energetic, lively, highly contested football game. And that's what you want from these matchups. You don't want the sideshow antics. And unfortunately, you did get that with the comments from Mark Harlan. But hey, I mean, high high emotion, high intensity in this game. And probably would want to go about it a different way, especially after the commentary from the school president saying rival right. But that's how he went about it. And his message clearly got across because it has gone viral since that thing was released. BYU next up, they take on the Kansas Jayhawks coming up this Saturday. Hey, look, we'll have more coverage of this BYU-Utah game. I just got to get to bed. I'm a little little bit tired. Uh, It's almost 5 (laughs) a.m. I got to get to bed. So I'll break it down more here on the Cougar Tracks podcast and Cougar Nation, Monday night, 6 to 7. We'll take your phone calls on this game. I want to hear from all of you, Cougar Nation. Call in. Share your thoughts, your feelings, where you were, how you were th- feeling when BYU had that final drive. Share your thoughts, 6-7, to seven, Cougar Nation on KSL News Radio. I'll talk to you next time here on the Cougar Tracks Podcast. It's powered by kslsports.com.